So I'm Alice Mizrahi, and today I will tell you about how we can compute with stochastic nano devices. And so this is the work that I have uh, done mainly during my PhD with the Daniel Carlos and Julie Gaulier, and then continued uh, at NIST with Mark Sachs. So we heard a lot about magnetic tunnel junctions and how they're very useful for memory and computing. But the thing is that when we're trying to use magnetic tunnel junctions, we want to reduce the energy barriers between the two states. And the reason for that is that if we make them small, we reduce the energy barrier. And if we want to reduce the energy required to program them, we also need to reduce these energy barriers. And the problem is that as we reduce these energy barriers, these two stable states become not so stable because the thermal noise can induce random switches between the parallel and anti-parallel states. And so our non-volatile memory uh, actually, it becomes actually a stochastic uh, oscillator. And so you see here an extreme case of uh, thermal instability, where here you see this is a measurement of the resistance versus time. And you see that we have the two states, anti-parallel and parallel, but the state is uh, switching randomly back and forth. And so we would think that what can we do with the stochastic devices? And I'm glad that Tara had kind of introduced it, uh, that we need a sources of randomness. And uh, so this is an interesting device uh, for several reasons. And the first one is that these oscillations are not due to some uh, driving current or something. This is just the thermal noise making the state go back and forth across the energy barrier. So this is completely driven by thermal noise. So we don't need to feed any kind of energy into the system to have this uh, oscillatory behavior. So that's very interesting if you're trying to build systems that do not consume a lot of energy. The second thing is that this device has this two-state behavior. And so as many have said, probably it's a good idea to have a system that you can integrate within a CMOS framework. So here having this two state um, behavior will help us to go towards a digital encoding. Okay, and the second thing is that, okay, we have this device for, that brings a stochasticity, that brings randomness, and there has been a, a question about what would be good features of stochastic devices, and um, what we think is that we need a device that indeed brings stochasticity and randomness. Oh, here's the guy who has the question. <laughs> this is your stochastic device. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so, so here what is very interesting with this device is that although it has this behavior that's dominated by randomness, the randomness, the stochasticity is actually well understood and can be uh, controlled. So I will go a bit about how we can control this stochasticity and then I will give you a few ideas of what we can do with it. And um, obviously the, the idea that you can guess is that this is a, a random, um, uh, like it's a random bit stream, so it could be directly applied to stochastic computing as Tara showed. And for those who have seen Matthew posters, you see uh, ideas of how we can use that. Okay, so let's see how we control the stochasticity. So it's all about um, this dual time. So here I show you two examples of dual times in the anti-parallel states. And here, do I need to point it out? Okay, makes sense. This is not where it's, okay. <laughs> I was just pointing in the screen and, okay. So here are two examples of dwell times in the parallel state. And so obviously these are random times, but uh, they have, they follow statistic. They follow actually a Poisson processes. And so what we can do is influence the, the statistic. We can influence the mean dwell times in each state. And um, this is actually done, um, through the phenomenon of a spin transfer torque on this slide, but uh, as you know, in a spin transfer device, there are many other handles that could be used uh, to control this mean dwell time. So here I show with a spin transfer torque. So you see here we have uh, our device and we apply a current through it. And what this current will do is that it's going to destabilize the energy landscapes so that one state become uh, more stable and one state become less stable. And so you see, for example, uh, on this measurement that if we apply a negative current, the uh, device will prefer to stay in the low resistance state. And on the contrary, with a positive current, it will prefer to stay in um, the high resistance state. So we can control kind of the average state, so the probability of a bit stream uh, with the current. But not only this, you see here that if we plot the rate 
of oscillator, so how many switches it go for second, like how fast our oscillator is, you see that this also varies with the current, and we have this uh, nice nonlinear uh, curve. And this will be uh, very useful because, as we have seen uh, well, the, through the week, nonlinearities in system is a key ingredient to have uh, computing and especially uh, bio inspired computing. And so I would like to, to point something else uh, that will also be very important in the following slides is that you see here we have transformed this analog current, kind of a real life value, into this uh, two states um, behavior. And so it can hint here that we have, um, in a stochastic way, an analog to digital conversion. And this will be uh, very important for us. Can I ask you a really just trivial question? Yes. Does the stochasticity depend on the voltage at all, too? So it's a resistance, so it's kind of, it's both. So you, you could have the exact same, well, not exact, but you can have an equivalent plot with voltage. Okay, it's a resistance, so you vary the voltage, you vary the current. Yes, but yes, good point. Um, okay, so you see that, so we have this device. Uh, who it is a stochastic, but we understand how it works. We have very good models of it done by uh, some people uh, in this room. And so we can uh, use the stochasticity. And so I would like to point out also that I'm speaking of a stochastic junction versus stable junction, but actually it's a continuum, right? The, the physics is always the same. It's just that the time scales between switches uh, are very different. And so um, I think that for different energy barriers in the device, or for different uh, time scales, we can have different applications. So the most mainstream one, when we have large barriers, and you can have years that go by before having a single switch uh, between the state, and so then you can use this uh, for storage. You can use, and this is what is used in uh, MRAM technology, but as, as you know, already starting to be commercialized. And as you reduce the energy barrier, you will arrive to another extreme, where the barrier is very small. And then you will have only maybe microseconds between the switches. And so here you're in this fully stochastic regime and you can do many things with it. So the, the most straightforward idea is to use our device as a stochastic bitstream generator and do stochastic computing with it. So uh, I will not talk about this today. So for those who didn't see Matthew Foster, it's too late, you'll have to wait for papers. <laughs> <laughs> but actually there's already a, a few a few papers on that online, so you're welcome to go look at it. Um, and so today I will talk about two things. The first thing is that we can use this uh, device as a stochastic spiking neurons. And I will show you how when we do this, we can also do something called continuously learning. And then we can allow to have synaptic weights, so memories that are not that uh, stable, and we can use um, kind of this slightly stochastic um, MTJ as well. Uh, and the second thing I want to talk about today is that, okay, this device is an oscillator, and today we had a lot of talk about the importance of oscillators, and so I will show you how we can uh, do synchronization with this stochastic oscillator. Okay, so let's start with um, how to use our stochastic device as a stochastic spiking neurons. So first I will give a very brief um, uh, background on stochastic spiking neurons, and I will show you how we can um, emulate them with our device and what to do with them. Okay, uh, so it has been observed in the brain that neurons tend to emit uh, voltage spikes. And so there's a big debate about whether these spikes are stochastic or not, but at least it has been observed that in some areas of the brain and some cases, um, you have spikes that have the same amplitude in voltage, but which time interval seems to be stochastic. And so one proposal by neuroscientists about how the brain would be encoding information with this stochastic uh, spike of train is to use something called rate coding. So rate coding is just the idea that the information is the rate, so the number of spikes per second. And so this is, um, this is as uh, Tara kind of already mentioned, something that is interesting because it's robust to errors. Indeed, if you miss one spike or think you counted a spike, it's not going to vary your average rate so much. So it's robust to error, and one thing that is also uh, quite interesting is that you can decide to observe for a little bit of time, and you will have a quick approximate result that doesn't consume too much energy to get. And then if you can afford to spend more energy, you can observe longer and get a more precise result. 
So uh, this is really something that is quite uh, intrinsic to stochastic computing, this idea that you can choose uh, the trade-off between energy consumption and precision of your results. So that's something that's uh, really useful. Okay, so another indication of um, the, the, that the brain might use rate coding is the fact that the rate varies with the stimulus received by the neuron. So here is um, data from an experiment made on a monkey, uh, which I did not perform. I know that uh, <laughs> Laura would frown otherwise. Uh, and so here the monkey was made to observe a target that could have variable direction. And uh, here is observation of the response, so the, the rate of spikes of a neuron connected to the eye of a monkey. And what we observe is that when we vary the direction of the target, the response varies as well. And it varies with this nonlinear um, uh, curve that is called a tuning curve in neuroscience. And so here is indication that uh, the rate is encoding the stimulus. Okay, so um, here you see that we have this uh, clear analogy between the stochastic spiking neurons and the stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions. So in uh, the neuron, we have the stochastic spikes. And in the nano device, we have the stochastic switches. And actually, many of these neurons are modeled as Poisson oscillator as well. And uh, so um, if we try to do rate coding with our uh, device, we will count the number of switches per second. And you see that when you apply a stimulus, as I have shown you previously, the rate will vary. And you see that we even have uh, the same type of nonlinearity, this bell-shaped curve. So we have a clear analogy between uh, the device and the neuron. So now uh, what we find is like, okay, uh, let's see what neuroscientists have proposed that computing can be done with the spiking neurons, and we will apply it to the nano device. So one uh, paradigm that neuroscientists have proposed with stochastic neurons is called population coding. So in population coding, you don't have a single neuron connected to the eye of a monkey, as you can imagine, but you have uh, several of them, so population of neurons. And each of these neurons have similar tuning curves, so all bell-shaped, but you see that each have a different um, preferred direction. And so the idea here is that information is not encoded in the rate of a single neuron, but in the rate of all the populations. And so here is a, um, I will show you in a schematic view how we can uh, encode information with a population. So here are two examples of two different directions observed by the eye. And so what we do here is that we let the neuron uh, spikes and we count the rate. And then we plot the rate uh, versus the preferred direction of each neuron. And you see that we obtain these noisy hills. And so this gives us an indication of where the stimulus was. So in this case, for example, you see we have this hill like this with a peak here. So we think, OK, probably um, the, preferred, the direction observed was around here. And you can have a more sophisticated decoding schemes, but that's kind of a, the basic idea that from the entire population, from the assembly of rates, you can uh, infer what was the information encoded. And so why is population coding uh, an interesting form of coding? Well, the first thing is that once again, it is robust to error. Because imagine if you lose one neuron. If you lose one of these little dots, you see that you can more or less make the same reasoning and get a good approximative result. So it's robust to uh, loss of neurons, is robust to having variability between the neurons. And this is great because these are the kind of issues that we also face with nano devices. Okay? And the second thing is that it's not just a robust way to encode information, it's also an interesting way to transform information. And the reason for that is that these assemblies of curves actually form a basis set of functions. And what this means is that if you do linear combination of these curves, you can construct nonlinear functions. And so this, uh, is this way, um, you can just do nonlinear. Uh, non you can do linear transformations and get nonlinear functions. So that's a good way to uh, transform information. Okay. So what we wanted to do then is show that you can do population coding with the nano devices. Okay. So here uh, is a result from an experiment. 
So here you have a, a small population of nine uh, stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions, each in one color. And so the little squares are the experimental data and um, the, the line that, that should be smooth of the model is just an um, just image problem. Um, and so here you see that I have shown uh, the rates of the tuning curves. And I would like to point out that these are normalized rates. They actually have very big difference in the actual rates. So um, this shows that you have a lot of device uh, to device variability, as you can also see from the difference in the width. So we have this very imperfect population. And uh, despite this, we can do population coding with it. So what we do is that we try to construct nonlinear transformations. And we do this by taking linear combination of this experimental data. So um, here are three examples of a nonlinear function that we constructed. And so here you see uh, they um, imitate um, handwritten letters that spell R-U-M. OK, so <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it was hard to do the experiment. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good result. <laughs> and uh, OK, so this is a, an experimental demonstration of how you can do stochastic nano devices to encode and transform information. OK, so uh, now how do we go from this uh, good encoding and transformation of information to an actual computing system? So for this, we need several things. We need that the result of the computing system is encoded in the same way as the input, because we want this to be a, a computing unit that can be modular and cascaded with other computations. And also, I, have, uh, I kept telling you about this linear combination. So we want to know how we're going to choose uh, the weights of these linear combinations. And so in this example, because it was just with a small population, we just did uh, an analytical solving of the weights, but this is not practical for a real system um, that would do uh, interesting computing. So uh, we propose a computing system that is an artificial neural network that works with magnetic tunnel junctions. And so you have magnetic tunnel junctions that are small and stochastic as neurons. And so here, what really matters are the rates, and these rates this population of rates will encode the input value that goes into the computing. And then we have a result that is encoded in an output population of rates. Okay? And then to go from the input to the output, we have a transformation. And the transformation is encoded in the weights of the linear combinations. And so here we need to store these weights. And an idea to uh, store them is just to use uh, big, stable magnetic neural junctions in the same way as we use MRAMs. And so this way, you could imagine having a single stack of materials with small device for the neurons and large device for uh, the synapses. So that's a good way that you can do only one new technology on top of CMOS to have uh, your entire neural network. OK, so we still need to know how we're going to choose these weights that we store in uh, the MRAMs. And so here again, we are going to take inspiration from the brain and we're going to learn them by trial and error. So uh, to have an, an idea of how this learning could work, we're going to think of this, um, the most simple computation ever, which is just to transfer information. So the identity function, but a bit more than this, because uh, if you want to transfer information from this population to another population and that they are not the same, uh, actually, this computation is more like a, a, basis, um, a basis change, a basis transformation. So let's imagine here that we have a robot that has a visual sensor that's observing a target that can have different directions. And then this robot also has a mechanical arm uh, that is trying to catch the target. And so what we want to do is that, that our input population of neuron connected to the eye knows the direction of a target and will transmit it to the population connected to the mechanical arm. And so what we, what we do is that um, the output rates that control the output uh, come from linear combination of the input rates. And we want to find the right weights. So we start with random weights. And uh, we are going to give random orientations to the targets 
and every time uh, the gripper is trying to catch it. And so at every time we're going to modify the weights to learn. So what happens is that we present an orientation, we try to catch it. And then either we have managed to catch it, so we don't modify the weights because they're good, either we don't manage to catch it, and then we change the weight uh, a little bit depending on if the gripper was too high or too low. And I'm happy to explain uh, the learning rule in more details later, but basically it's very simple. We don't need to compute a precise error. We just want to know, do we catch it or are we too high or too low? Okay, so here I show you a simulation results. So uh, here I have taken a task a bit more complex. So as you can see in the inset here, what we're trying to do is that the output value is the sign of the input value, okay? And so you see here I have plotted the error. So the error is the distance between the gripper and the target. And uh, here I have plotted the number of learning steps, so the number of time we had to modify the weights. And you can see that, as expected, the error will decrease the number of learning steps and reach a minimum values that can be, um, that, can, that depends on parameters of a system and I can take question on this. Okay, so here we show uh, that our system can learn a transformation uh, with a simple rule and using this uh, stochastic neurons. Okay, so to see if this um, system is uh, useful for real, we need to uh, compare it to what can be done without our stochastic nano devices. And uh, so for this, we need to know how they perform. So we need to know how much energy the system will consume and how much area it would take on the chip. And so this was done uh, mostly by uh, uh, Tiffen, who is a Damien student at Citroen. Okay, so what he has done is that he took, um, he designed a full architecture of a system and then used uh, design tools used by industrials, uh, so Cadence for those who know it, to estimate the energy consumption and the area on the chip. And so here are the results, and what uh, you see is that we have three contributions. The first one in blue is the contribution of the neurons, so the stochastic magnetic tunnel junctions. Then we have the contribution of the synaptic weights, so the stable magnetic tunnel junctions. And then we have some CMOS overhead. So what does they do? So they need to detect the switches of the junctions, they need to count them to compute the rate, they need to implement the linear transformation, and to implement the learning rules. So uh, there may be ideas in the future to do it uh, also with other devices, but for now we have shown uh, how we can do it with CMOS. And so you see here that the first thing that we observe is that the neurons don't really consume anything compared to the rest. And because the energy consumption of the neurons has been reduced so much, what remains is mostly the CMOS overhead, actually. And also in the learning, um, this is what is due to writing the weights, actually writing the stable magnetic tunnel junctions. And one important thing is that uh, you see here that the, um, the energy difference between the calculation and the learning are not that different. So here the learning doesn't consume so much more. So in, in traditional um, um, neural networks, <laughs> often the learning takes much, much, much more energy than the calculation and therefore you can never do it on a chip. And so here, because the learning doesn't consume so much more, uh, there is hope that it can be done online, so directly on the chip. Okay, and um, so to see if this uh, means anything, we need to compare it to a neuron that would only use CMOS. Okay, so here, um, there are many ways actually to implement CMOS neurons, and they all have different pros and cons, and I'm, I'm happy to show you more details on this. But basically, even taking the best numbers, what you see is that we can consume less energy than using only CMOS, and also take less area on the chip. And what is the key reason of this success? Well, actually, in all these CMOS on implementation, the bottleneck in terms of energy and area is going from real-world signals that are analog to a digital encoding. And this consumes a lot of energy. But in our system, as I have told you, we have this kind of intrinsic stochastic analog to digital uh, conversion that is being done by the stochastic junction itself. And so we kind of managed to overcome the energy bottleneck this way. So this has uh, shown that uh, a system could be promising for real uh, applications. 
Okay, so how can we make it even better? So you see here that um, in the implementation of the learning, the synaptic waves still consume a lot of energy. So maybe we can reduce that. So um, also I have told you that the learning doesn't consume so much, so we can do the learning on the chip. And so this is great because if the learning was very, very expensive, what we would do, and that is what is done usually, is that we would learn once for all the transformation, and then we would let the system go, and it would just do its computations. But if something happens, if, uh, for example, some device fails, then your system will not function anymore. But in our case, because it can continuously learn, it can always adapt to new situations or to changes of its hardware, for example. And so we can do this continuous learning. And thanks to that, I will show you that we can reduce the energy even more. So how to reduce the energy? Well, um, remember that we're using these magnetic tunnel junctions to store the weights. And so when we modify the weights to do learning, we have to write them. And the current that we need to write them is proportional to the energy barrier of these junctions. And so the power is um, proportional to the square of the energy. And so, um, as you can imagine, uh, the higher the energy barrier, the most power it takes to uh, have the learning. Uh, but also, if they're more stable, um, you need, to, so here we're co learning continuously. And so every time uh, the weight flips, so it fails, it loses its energy because of thermal fluctuations, we need to relearn it. So we need to rewrite it, okay, and we have errors. So here I show you, in the case of a fixed number of neurons, what happens when we change the energy barrier of the weight. And so what you see, so here is a parametric curve. So here we increase the energy barrier. And you see that when we make the weights more stable, we make less error, but also we consume more power. So you see that there is a trade-off. And now we, change, now we change the number of neurons. And so you see, when we have more neurons, we have a better precision, because we have a better basis set. So I think that, that's quite intuitive. But also, we have more synapses to write, we consume more power. So again, we have a, a natural uh, trade-off. And you see that we can uh, find this optimum. For each error, we can find what is uh, the less power we could consume. OK? And so this is actually giving us a guidelines on how to design a neural network. So here, you see, I have uh, plotted for each data of the optimum uh, the number of neurons that it takes and the energy barrier of the weight. So let's imagine that we have a specific application where we know that our precision must be so that we only tolerate 3% of error. So we look here at 3% of error, and it will tell us uh, that the best way to do it is to use, um, so here, 50 neuron in, 54 neurons in each population and uh, a weight that have an energy barrier of 12 kBT. So this tells us that's the optimal way uh, to build the system. And I would like just to point out that the energy barriers that it gives for the weights are well below what is used in traditional MRAMs. So basically, uh, by having this continuous learning, and accepting that our synaptic weights can make error that we need to relearn them, we can then make, uh, less, make them uh, much less power consuming. Okay, so um, this was our uh, neural network made with magnetic tunnel junctions. So we have stochastic ones to do the neurons. And in the case of continuous learning, we can use also uh, slightly stochastic uh, junctions as synaptic weights. And so this network is capable of learning and adapting. Um, we have also shown that it is uh, resilient to variability between the um, devices and also unreliability. So if it loses neurons, it can recover. And uh, so I think that a key, um, uh, a key application for this would be a smart sensor where you really care about your energy consumption and also having a small surface on chip. And error are maybe not the, the worst thing but really you care about having energy and adaptation. Okay, so this is uh, the first part. So before I go to synchronization, uh, do we have questions on that? Okay. Yes. 
when you apply a bias current. So you can also find some limit cycle in your system. So because you apply current, this is the current uh, can compensate the damping, you can find some limit cycle. Oh, but here we apply a very low current. So it's low, it's critical. Yes, yes. Yes, the idea is that um, because it's low energy barrier, the thermal noise make it oscillate, and you just slightly bias it. But yeah, you don't force it. OK, but this, this will be a bit connected. So um, I move on to the second part, which will be quite short. But I just, um, I just wanted to show you how we can synchronize our stochastic oscillator. And there has been a lot of talk about how synchronization of oscillators is important for computing. And so here I will show you that we can not only do this with a stable oscillator, but also with a stochastic oscillator. And so here, by using uh, this junction that are stochastic, we relax the constraint on the energy barriers. So they're more easy to fabricate. They consume less energy. And I also will show you that we only need uh, very small uh, biases to control them. So it would be a very low power solution. OK. So what we're going to do is that we're going to synchronize this stochastic oscillator by using noise. And so I thought that Tara would tell us a bit about noise-induced synchronization. And then I was mortified when she told us how noise was helping us to get rid of synchronization. <laughs> yes? So that's a kind of a beauty of it, is that it really depends on your application. So if you don't take a long time, you have few statistics you have a very approximate result, but it doesn't consume much to get it because you don't have to bias the junctions for long. But then if you need more precision, you'll have to observe longer, which will consume more. But it's really an interesting trade-off. So you can choose, depending on the application, how long you observe. And the same system could have different precision and energy consumption uh, given the applications. OK. Yeah, I have a very yes. quick question. How do you read that out, the rates? Your, jun your junction yes. ju is just a, you know, resistance. Yes, yes, yes. So how do you get that nice, uh, nice rate as a function of current that looks sort of like a Maxwellian or Gaussian? Okay, so you, j so the, the rate here is just the number of switches. No, the spiking rate. That's a number, and, yes. and you use that as a basis function. Yes. But what circuit is that? A circuit output? Oh, okay, or? okay. So, so um, there, there is uh, a circuit. Uh, to detect the switches. And so basically, um, first thing is to convert the, the two states to two states in digital. And so this could be done with a circuit called the uh, pre-charge sense amplifier. And so basically, it's something where you compare the junction to a reference junction that's below. And so it's, it's bistable. And okay, I can, I can give you more details. And, okay. and so then basically, you just need to detect the edge. Uh, so it's it's, it's contained in the CMOS overhead. So it's something, but it's not a huge, actually. Um, OK, so noise-induced synchronization. How could we first synchronization with a stochastic device seems a bit weird, and then using noise on top of it to induce it is uh, even weirder, but actually it works. OK, so let's take a very simplistic view of uh, the junction. So really, this idea that OK, we have these two threshold voltages. And when we apply a voltage to the junction, if we're above the threshold, we can induce a switch. So that's really simplistic view. Um, but I think it helps to understand. So if we want to get the state of the junction, its resistance to synchronize on a drive, that would be a high energy way to do it, where we determinedly force the junction to go back and forth. But that consumes a lot of energy, right? Because it's a high voltage. So then what we can do is place ourselves in this sub-threshold regime. So you see that the signal alone is not inducing any switches of a junction because we are below the threshold. Now what we do is that we add this um, noise to the signal. And you see that the noise sometimes makes you go above the threshold and you get some uh, switches. And at low noise, you see that these are stochastic and there's no synchronization. But if we add the right amount of noise, uh, so this is what uh, Tara explained us in the stochastic facilitation, we have uh, this sweet spot uh, where the noise is inducing switches at the right moment. And so we have synchronization of the junction on the signal, even though the signal was below the threshold. And if we have too much noise, 
you see that we have these uh, supplementary uh, switches. So here we lose the synchronization. So really, it's this optimal noise range. OK, so uh, we did this experimentally. So we have our junction. And it is a room temperature, so there is thermal noise. And uh, we uh, apply to it this square periodic voltage uh, that has a, a, low, uh, a low amplitude compared to the critical voltage of a junction. And on top of it, we add electrical noise. And so what we do is that uh, to monitor synchronization is that we measure the frequency of the junction, so the rate of the switches, and also uh, we look at its resistance state. And so here we have put the resistance state and here uh, the, the drive voltage. And so you see that when we have no uh, electrical noise, the frequency of the junction is uh, small. And as you can see on panel one, you just have a few um, stochastic uh, switches. You don't have synchronization. And then as we increase the electrical noise, you see that the junction starts to get faster and faster. And we reach this plateau where uh, the frequency of the junction is equal to the frequency of the drive. And as you can see on panel two, we also have a phase locking between the junction and the drive. And again, if we have too much noise, you see on panel three that we have these um, unwanted switches and we lose synchronization. So you see here that for an optimal range of noise, we have experimentally managed to uh, use noise to induce synchronization of the stochastic device on a low uh, amplitude uh, drive. And so I would like to point out that the sweet spot is just not a wine uh, fine-tuned level of noise, but a, a broad range of noise. So it's something that can be uh, achieved realistically. OK, so that was an experimental demonstration of noise-induced synchronization. And uh, we have developed also an analytical model that, that gives you um, the boundaries of the range of noise where we have synchronization. And so here uh, we look at how uh, changing the frequency and the amplitude of the drive can modify the, the noise region where we have synchronization. So you see again the symbols are experiments and the dash lines are the analytical model. And so the pink regions is where you have synchronization. So you see here at fixed uh, frequency, there is this broad uh, range of amplitudes where you can induce synchronization. And what I find uh, particularly interesting is to see what happens when we vary the frequency of the drive. And so you see here our junction that was naturally very slow. Um, its frequency was only 0.1 hertz. But by applying electrical noise, we managed experimentally to synchronize it to um, periodic drives of frequency of several kilohertz. And so I think this is a big advantage of this noise-induced uh, synchronization is that you don't need the, um, the oscillator to have a frequency very close to what you want to synchronize it to, uh, because it can be done on really these huge uh, ranges of frequencies. OK? Uh, so, um so can I ask one thing? Yeah. Uh, did I get this right? So um, your, your junctions are ferromagnetic yes. for, for that time scale, basically, for the synchronization time scale. Yes. Yes. Yes, it's really the, the, the magnetization is always like a mono magnetization and it just flips back and forth. Yes. Um, what's the upper limit of the frequency on the, I mean, you stop it. Yes, yeah, so in, in, indeed, that's a very good question. So as you can kind of infer, uh, eventually it will cross. So you cannot go indefinitely. Indeed, yes. And so depending on at which amplitude this is done, and what is your natural frequency, all this is very. And uh, kind of obviously, as, and as you can see here, uh, if you have a larger signal, you have broader ranges of noise and frequency where you can synchronize, but it consumes more energy. Yes. So the functional dependency on the electrical noise magnitude, is it related just to the fact that with higher frequency, you have actually an effective larger heating also, that the sample becomes uh, hotter, and so the energy barrier becomes correspondingly lower? So I don't I don't think it's the heating, but basically, yes, if you have, basically when you have noise, you have many uh, short period of time where you in effect, the the yes, the it's white Gaussian noise. And basically what happens is that when the voltage is high, it has a high probability to flip, right? And so if you have a lot of noise, 
you have many of these high voltage events where you have an opportunity that is high to jump. Only if it's acting long enough. So if you think you're at a frequency range where you're at the Lamour frequency, the noise above would probably not affect the noise switch. But you're far away from this. But, uh, okay, it's, it's, yeah, maybe. So it must be, what is this time scale defining the... So the electrical noise in this experiment uh, was 120 megahertz. So indeed, it's uh, it's smaller compared to uh, the Lamour. But it's I don't think it's uh, I, I mean probably the heating has obviously to play a role, but I don't think it's the dominant effect. So, and I have uh, if you're interested, I have kind of also models on how the noise raises the frequency and stuff. So. Okay, so that um, let's conclude this part. So uh, we have this device that can be potentially synchronized at very low energy. Um, and there has been a lot of talk on how synchronization is interesting and important for computation, but uh, all these schemes are for deterministic um, harmonic oscillators. So what would be great is to kind of reinvent these schemes for this bistable stochastic oscillator. Um, so I hope maybe this will motivate some people. Uh, so really, there's, I think there's a lot of, of potential for this. And so this concludes my, my talk. So um, I think what is great about these stochastic devices is that they benefit on the good things of traditional magnetic field junctions. So uh, they are endurance, uh, they are reliable, we, we understand them well, uh, they are compatible with CMOS, and uh, here I have shown kind of um, uh, just spin transfer talk, but all the new handles of spin stronic that are being developed, like all the spin orbit effects, for example, could be potentially used also to control such devices. And I think we'll, we'll learn a, also a bit <laughs> with uh, Karim uh, tomorrow. And okay, so these devices have all these good things of spintronics, and also they are this very interesting uh, device that are stochastic that are powered by noise. So we have here uh, all the energy of thermal noise that usually goes to weight that we can somehow uh, harness here. And uh, because um, they are with these small energy barriers, they are driven by small biases, and uh, they do this intrinsic analog to digital conversion, which is super useful for uh, devices that go from the real world, to, which is analog, to the digital world. And uh, also, again, there are many devices that are stochastic. In uh, nano uh, science, it's harder to have something not stochastic rather than stochastic. But here, it's not any stochasticity, because really, it's something that we understand well, that we can model well, and that we can control. So I think this is really a, a promising stochastic device for unconventional computing. And I have shown you two ideas on how to use it, uh, stochastic spiking neurons and stochastic uh, oscillator for synchronization. But I think there are many more potential ideas. And I hope that uh, some of you will maybe uh, work on it and find new ideas. Thank you.